All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just admitting the last few people from the lobby and we're going to dive right in. We're really excited to have everyone here. We had a great turnout. Um, I think we were supposed to have over 100 attendees in, in, in today's call. Um, and as all you as you all know, the topic today is going to be launching and sustaining a men's shed webinar on funding opportunities for new and established sheds. And I think in the interest of time, we're going to dive right in. Just so everyone knows, we are recording today's webinar. Um, so we'll be able to that'll that'll get sent out to everyone afterwards. So if you if you do miss something, that's fine. Um, and then we're always here to answer questions over email um, afterwards. All right. So in terms of today's agenda, we're going to go through. We do have a, a I, I asked everyone, as you saw, likely in the a registration form, I asked everyone, what was your familiarity with sheds? And we have people who have years and years of experience shedding on the call today. We also have some people who are very, very new to it. And so the first little bit will be catered towards the people who are very new. We also have um, a lot of a lot of topics today that will be targeted towards people who have established sheds. And we have three experienced shedders on the call with us today who are going to be sharing with you what they, how things have worked at their shed and where they've found funding for. So hopefully there'll be a little bit for everyone. In terms of our webinar etiquette today, so the, all everybody's cameras and microphones will be off. It's just to ensure that we have no issues with bandwidth during the call. Um, given we have people from across the country um, in both urban and rural areas, we want to make sure that everybody um, can hear the call. And so we've, we've just limited that in that way. Now, there you will see at the top of your screen, um, there is a, a chat feature on on this like there is with Zoom if this is your first time using Microsoft Teams. And so uh, both the chat and the Q&A feature are open. Um, so please, when you have questions, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A as you think about them. We won't be breaking in the middle. We're just going to run through a whole presentation and we've set aside 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. So please, uh, please ask away in, in the chat as we go forward here. Okay, there's four presenters today. My name is Evan Foster. I'm the um, ambassador and coordinator for Men's Sheds at Help Age Canada. I'm going to be taking us through the, the first few topics today. Then I'm going to pass it off to Ron Smith, who's from the Burlington Men's Shed, Matthew Quetton, who's from the Salt Spring Vet Shed, and Cliff Irving from, Irving from the Vanderhoof Men's Shed, the latter two being in British Columbia. So again, I recognize that many people on this call know what a men's shed is, but I want to I want to start it off because there's some people who are very new to the, the concept. And as much as a it's called a men's shed, a men's shed is not necessarily a physical shed, although some groups do meet in the shed in a shed. But a men's shed is a community based group that provides safe, friendly, safe, friendly and inclusive environment to gather and participate in group activities. And there's really two benefits to the men's shed to men's sheds one is to adv advance the physical and mental health and well-being of the members but the extension of that is to really foster positive engagement within their community and really for the benefit of the community so it's not just necessarily a benefit to the participants but a benefit to, to the community at large as well it is a national movement. This is a map of, of the sheds, just the sheds that have actually been funded by both the United Way of BC and Help Age Canada, um, and who've actually reached the point of outcome report. So if you don't see uh, a, a hammer where your shed is, don't worry that we're, we're populating this list as we go. But as you can see, it goes all the way from Vancouver Island all the way out to Nova Scotia. And we actually just recently had a shed, our first shed start um, start activities in Newfoundland. So we, this really is a, a national movement. And I wanna point out that, that we don't do this on our own here at Help Age. The sheds don't necessarily just do it on their own too. We do have a, a, an evolving national structure and support system here in Canada. It starts with an, our national colleagues at Men's Shed Canada. And we do have four provincial associations in Ontario, Alberta, Manitoba, and British Columbia. And so if you do, if you are from one of those provinces and you are thinking of starting a shed, we do really encourage you to reach out to your local provincial association. There's opportunities for support and mentorship through that. Um, and it really helps bring together the community of sheds in that province. And of course, there are some provinces that are left out, not to fret. The folks at Men's Shed Canada um, will, will certainly be willing to offer the mentorship. And we hope that as shedding grows in these other provinces, provincial associations will form there as well. We're just not quite there yet, as it is a, a newer movement um, in some of these provinces. 
And this is a great quote. I don't believe the man who said this quote is on the call, but I believe it was Doug. This is a, a Doug Mackey's quote for those who know that name. Um, and I think it's really important in listening to, to our, conver our presentation today, because if you've seen one men's shed, you've only seen one men's shed. They're all different and they're all tailored to their community and their community needs. And so you're going to hear from three different folks today who have done things one way there. It doesn't mean that you have to do it the same way in your shed. All the sheds are different and, and we'll see that even reflected on to, throughout the presentations today. Uh, we have sheds that do bike repair. We have sheds that do more traditional woodworking. Um, we have sheds that just are very much social. And so it really comes down to what your group wants to do. And that's really the one unique thing about this. Okay, so this is kind of the first funding topic we're going to start about, which is our startup grants that we offer at Help Age Canada. And so what, what is a startup grant? A startup grant is meant to really help a shed launch, help a shed get started. And so we encourage, whether it's an organization, an association, just a group of guys in the community, to really start by looking for interested individuals. So these are the prospective shed members. And also looking for community partners because it's really important to have a community partner um, to help support your shed as it grows. Um, that might be providing space or whatnot, and, and we'll get into a few different things later on. Uh, but with our startup grants at HelpAge, if you have at least two people who are interested in getting a men's shed started, you're eligible to apply for a $1,000 startup grant. And it's really meant to be a low barrier to entry. Really, anybody can apply for one of these. The link's there, and we can drop that in the chat for people as well. Um, and it's just on our HelpAge Canada website um, that you can access that. And what can you use startup grants for? Well, really anything that's going to help get your shed off the ground. So marketing and promotional materials, right? Brochures, flyers, mail outs. If those, if you believe those are what's going to help in your community get a shed started, that would be an eligible expense. Room rentals and, and catering for meetings. If you want to attract people with food, we always encourage that. Um, for the first couple of meetings, again, th those expenses can be covered by a startup grant. Um, some basic tools and supplies. Again, if you are going to more traditional shed route, with, which might be more woodworking or whatnot, you could purchase basic tools and supplies with the grants that we offer. Insurance, that's a big a big piece of it. And, and I know some of the, the groups today will talk about um, a little bit about what they've how they've tackled some of the insurance and liability concerns. Um, but insurance could be covered and some sheds do uh, decide to incorporate as nonprofits. And again, that would be also some, an eligible expense um, under our startup grants. I do want to briefly just touch upon the difference between applying as an organization versus a community member. And so we've actually included this distinction in the application to ask whether an applicant is a community organization or a community member, for example, a, a, a man somewhere in, in a community there. And so the reason we've done this is because we believe in the importance of consulting with the community prior to starting a shed or applying for a grant. And so if it's a group of guys who are in a community who are applying on their behalf, well, they don't necessarily need to do that consulting. That's their need. They've said this is something we want to do, right? But if it's an organization, we do ask a little for a couple extra questions to say, hey, have you gone out and have you looked to make sure this is a need in your community? There are people who are interested in, in being a part of a men's shed in your community. And so again, it's just a few extra questions, but Ultimately, these startup applications are between five to seven questions. Again, it's a really low barrier because we want to give people the opportunity to get these sheds started. And finally, what responsibilities if you do you have if you receive a startup grant? Well, there's really three things. One is holding the funds, and this is an important piece. Uh, we do recommend uh, managing all the funds through a shed bank account, so not necessarily your own personal bank account. Um, a lot of sheds have opened up their own bank account even very early on to hold some of these funds, and so they're managed by a few of the kind of founding founding shed members. Or, of course, if it's an organization that does, is starting the shed, they could hold it in their bank account. And of course, executing the proposed activities. So going through and, and, and doing kind of what you said you're going to do in the grant. That's of course a responsibility uh, at once receiving it and a really short, short outcome report. And I know that some of the folks on the call here have received startup grants in the past. And I think they can attest that it is not a, a huge administrative burden in terms of the outcome reporting. We do ask just a few short questions about how many people are attending the shed. Um, you know, what were some of the challenges in getting it started? What do you think were some of the facilitators to getting it started? So again, it's really supposed to be that kind of low barrier to get a shed started. And I'm going to stop talking there. I know I went through that pretty quickly, uh, but I'm going to hand it off to now Ron Smith, who's from our Burlington Men's Shed, um, and he's going to talk a, a bit about what they've done as they've been an emerging shed over the past year. So Ron, take it away. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Evan. Um, you've given me 420 seconds, I believe, so I'll I'll speak as quickly as I can, but I doubt that I can keep up with your with your pace, Evan. Um, so <clears throat> we'll we'll start with the the first slide. I mean, I'm a well, no, the can you back up, Evan? Just one one. I just I just wanted to point out, like I've always um, liked branding, and I like the idea of, uh, and I really liked an idea of a logo right from the start. It, it uh, from our initial communications, it gave us a way to to start creating an identity for the shed. And <clears throat> this is something I mocked it up in some uh, graphic um, software that I have here. But um, just just a little takeaway. There's um, there's a couple of places that you can find on the internet, like Upwork <clears throat> and Fiverr. And uh, these are these are sites where you can take something like a primitive logo that you want converted into something that looks good. And I wasn't able to do that. I couldn't get the corners right. It was driving me crazy. And uh, and in the, in my case, I had someone in Colombia, South America, uh, clean it all up for me and send it back in a vector format, and it cost thirty dollars. Okay. So it's one of those things that I think a lot of us. You know, reach points where we're technically challenged with something, and uh, some of those online resources are uh, really economical uh, and worth looking into. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. So, starting a starting a shed. I've I've done a lot of volunteer work in my life. <clears throat> I spent 12 years as a volunteer mentor for Futurepreneur. Um, I've uh, I've been the Vice Chair of Habitat for Humanity in the uh, in the Halton region. I've done work in Honduras, humanitarian work in Honduras, and and I would say <clears throat> throughout all these things, um, I've taken away m more than I've given. Um, that's just I never expected that when I went into it, but in cases like Futurepreneur, I mean, I ended up you know making friendships uh, with young people. You, uh, in a lot of cases, <clears throat> I wasn't the mentor. I became the mentee, and I was learning from them. So, so <clears throat> I've always won I've I've always enjoyed the volunteer work that I've done, uh, but I'd reached a point where <clears throat> maybe it's an age thing. Um, I got the impression with Futurepreneur that maybe I'd aged out a little bit in terms of what I was doing, and I was looking for something new, and. Uh, I came across, uh, I stumbled across it a few years ago, actually, the men's shed concept. And it was in a um, <clears throat> an article that uh, had been published by McMaster University. And um, I looked deeper into men's sheds. Uh, some of the things I really liked about it was uh, there was no central authority. They tend to be diverse, uh, in some cases, anachronistic, which I like. And uh, so it was kind of a clean, free slate. And so <clears throat> I just decided that uh, I just decided I was going to go for it. I didn't have anyone else to talk to about it. I just uh, connected with John Peters um, through the Ontario Men's Shed Association. And uh, John kind of got me started along with Nick with a few Zoom calls. And uh, and that gave me the, uh, the confidence to... Uh, to begin the next stages. So if you can flip over to the next slide, we'll <clears throat> we'll start working on the mission here. Um, I mean, the first challenge was trying to gather a group of men together who, who shared an interest in moving the idea forward. Um, and obviously, if, if I did that, I was going to need space to meet. So it's kind of like a chicken, it's kind of like a chicken egg thing. Where do you uh, where where do you get this thing going? So uh, <clears throat> I decided that um, I would try and partner with the city of Burlington. We have a uh, really heavy senior population in Burlington, population of about 200,000 people. And the city is, um, is, is really favors um, seniors' activities. Big advantage, <clears throat> you know, when I started talking to them was the brand. I think Manchads, <clears throat> Manchads has a brand that's that's actually more recognized than 
would have given it credit for. And uh, people at the city knew about men's sheds. They were interested in supporting us. And they stepped up and gave us free space for for the first six months. Um, we've, <clears throat> we've evolved from that, and, and they now host um, our shed. And, and what that means is that um, we have a local uh, senior center. Uh, they provide us with a room, and <clears throat> and we're part of the uh, the Burlington City of Burlington programming. So we're kind of getting a lot of free promotion. We're getting the space, and most importantly, we're getting the space without a rental commitment. So we pay forty bucks or three bucks per meeting. Um, if if only three or four people showed up, <clears throat> you know it. it it doesn't cost us, it costs us exactly the same amount of money. So we, we don't have a rent commitment. And and renting space is certainly in our area, our area became a huge problem because you need insurance. And, uh, you know, in order to get the insurance, you need to establish an, an incorporation or some sort of community group. Anyway, I won't, I won't linger too much on this, but, but I just want to point out that um, we gained a tremendous advantage in, in working with the city of Burlington, and um, and it's it's given us um, yeah big step up for our. We'll flip it over. Um, <clears throat> so lessons learned in the beginning, I, I had this great idea. I was going to uh, create a brochure, and the city offered to post it in all sorts of locations, and was looking to attract that core group to get a shed started. And the result was nada. I didn't get one call. I, I, I thought it was a great brochure, but uh, obviously it didn't resonate. Uh, didn't resonate well at all. <clears throat> one of one of but one of the things I persisted on, and it took a few few emails back and forth. But there was a local publication <clears throat> called Burlington Today, and they put out an online newsletter, and it's usually only three articles and. Uh, I thought they might be interested in what we were doing or what I was doing in trying to start this group. And they they <clears throat> they bought into it. They did an interview with me and uh, and that resulted in 25 inquiries. It, it was uh, a hell of a hell of a lift up for us. And it, and it really it was really an indicator to me of the power of uh, of social media versus <clears throat> versus print and. Uh, so I pass that along for what it it is. Um, and <clears throat> I guess my next point is I assumed at the beginning that I, you know, when we had this group of 25 people that I'd have a whole bunch of guys that are would buy into the concept and get excited about it. And um, that's not the case. It it it's it's not my nature to uh, to be patient. And um, and so I had to uh, I learned really quickly that I, I had to sit back and let this thing mature on its own. There's a there's a gestation period here that longer than certainly a lot longer than uh, than I anticipated. And uh, so it takes time for if you well, if you get a group together, it's going to take time for guys to get to know one another, feel comfortable with one another. Um, but it works. It, it comes together. So don't give up. Keep keep the thing going. There are a few times when I was thinking about giving up, but I'm glad I did. I mean, now I'm really glad I didn't. Um, and uh, yeah, the last point. It, it seems elementary, but believe me, it's <laughs> it's true. Um, presuming that everybody will remember, there's a meeting next week. Well, in the beginning, perhaps with a mature shed, that's that's um, that, that happens. But certainly in the beginning with our shed. Um, we had a few few meetings, and then the the numbers dwindled right off. And someone said to me, "Well, you have to send out a newsletter." And I'm like, what the hell, you know, I gave you have a schedule of when the meetings are. But so what I've learned is uh, the newsletter is important, and I send it out every week on a Sunday morning. And it's uh, it's about the things that we've done. It's about the things that we're going to do, and some stuff that I <clears throat> that I make up to try to keep it. Um, the the key to a newsletter, in my opinion, is 
having some attention getting headlines, just not a big, you know, a big paragraph that uh, that bores everybody. Um, it needs informative subheadings, and I think they really need visual elements. So if you have someone who's, you know, and I, I kind of like that stuff, who can flip pictures in there and uh, and search for, there's all sorts of free information that you can use. Um, it works well, and uh, and our solution has been Canva. <clears throat> and Canva, you can look it up online. Canva, it's, it's I don't think it's a very steep learning curve, but it, it allows you to uh, create really interesting newsletters. And the first, there's a free version, there's a paid version, and there's a there's actually a <clears throat> a, a really good free version for nonprofits. But um, you have to. I learned you had to be incorporated. I applied for the free version for nonprofits, and they uh, they rejected me. Flip it. How am I doing time wise here, Ron? We're, I was just gonna say we are tight for a little over okay, time. Okay, push, push along. I'll start talking fast. Is it so? Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. So the uh, we you're going to attract a few men that show up and don't come back. Get used to it. Don't take it personally. Um, it takes time for participants to get one to get to know one another and feel comfortable with one another. That's fact. Um, we've learned that. No single idea attracts everybody's attention. These these sheds are diverse, and it's going to take time. And you're probably going to end up with groups going into different uh, different activities. And um, the last point is that this we've we've got to the point where we spent half an hour at the first part of the meeting having a business kind of chat, although very uh, collaborative, it's not hierarchical. And um, and then the rest of it is uh, is just social. I don't know what everybody talks about, but they sure we sure do a lot of talking. Let's flip it over. And we've we've re we've remained cautious in applying for grants. Okay. And this doesn't mean I mean the Help Age Canada thousand dollar grant is very generous and, and I think it's a a great idea, and I support it. In our case, we had the advantage of having the city of Burlington partner with us, so that took care of a lot of fixed expenses that we might have otherwise had. And <clears throat> the only um, thing that um, has kept it away from us so far is that if we were going to use it to incorporate, we have a lot of people, in, and I agree with them, a lot of our members, um, Feel that the incorporation is fine. We pay for the incorporation, but the ongoing expenses as a result <clears throat> of of using um, these funds for incorporation is going to be well. Next one is insurance, but then there's ongoing unfunded expenses. There's accounting fees. There's uh, probably legal fees, and uh, so we we're 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 working. We're going carefully right now. Uh, we're looking at some project funding. And our <clears throat> objective with the project funding is to uh, try to create a sustainable model. So we won't go into a lot of detail on that at this point. But um, and, but Ron, there's, and there's you know there's things we have to learn. Okay, and I think the bottom the bottom part of the slide is, uh, is is something we have to learn. I mean, donors donate for their reasons, not ours. So when if we're applying for funds, we better we better figure out what. Uh, what rings a bell? Mm -hmm. Am I out of 420 seconds? Yet? <laughs> a little over. over, a little over. Wrong. over. A, Let's keep it going. But it's it's a really good segue. I'm going to skip this slide, Rogers, and thank you so much, and, and move okay. right into Matthew because to your point, it is really important to look at that kind of ongoing funding, and that's where the Salt Spring Men's Shed and Vander Roof have continued to grow. And so, Matthew, I'll turn it over to you, and and just let me know when you want me to switch slides. Thanks, Evan. Perfect. Thanks, Evan. Uh, thanks for your story, Ron. That's really inspiring. Um, I think our presentation takes a little bit of a different tack. Um, we wanted to speak to some of the tactical things we've done in building the shed and raising funds. Um, so, but you know, to your first point, um, I love our logo and I hate our logo. Um, visually, it tells a fantastic story and it's a conversation piece. Graphically, it's brutal to try and reproduce it anywhere other than in a full color image. Um, so lots to say about that, but uh, I think it, it says a lot about the story. Um, on Salt Spring, we're really fortunate to have a tight-knit, really engaged community uh, that's really supportive of creative pursuits and, and people working with their hands and so forth. 
and it's a very strong nonprofit um, community. So we, we gain a lot of benefit for just from where we are. Um, I just joined the Men's Shed in June of this year. I'm fairly new to Salt Spring, uh, and it was an opportunity for me to do what I love there at the Shed and uh, kind of integrate with community a little bit, which is fantastic. Uh, and I became a director and vice president uh, just at our last AGM in October, so still, still pretty new to the whole thing. Uh, you can flip over, Evan. Uh, so needless to say, we've been really successful in raising grants. Um, we've secured $78,000 in grants in a little over 18 months, um, primarily from the United Way, um, which I believe the Help Age is taking over that program now. Uh, so that was through three grants, one startup grant and two project grants. Um, we raised $25,000 from the Government of Canada New Horizons program, which is for a uh, inclusion and health and well-being for seniors. Um, and then locally, we worked with the Salt Spring Island Foundation on some project grants and uh, a really cool organization called 100 Men Who Care that is, we all donate um, $100 a month uh, and uh, make a $10,000 donation, or sorry, once a quarter and make a $10,000 donation four times a year. So that was a pretty cool fit for, uh, for the men's shed. Um, I can take no credit for these. All of these were secured before I came on board, um, but I think it's testament to how uh, good a job our founder, Tristan Lorillard, Lor did, um, and the capacity for Men's Shed to be successful in this regard. I don't think there's anything special about us. Um, you know, if we were able to do this, I think any shed could take this on. We can slip ahead. Um, yeah, so, you know, but what are the recipe for success? So, you know, I had a few interviews going into this. I talked to our founder, I talked to some of our other board members and our active members just sort of say, well, what is it that worked? Like, how did we, what story did we tell and who did we tell it to? Um, and I think what I took away from that is some of what I heard in your story, Ron, is that um, there are kind of four key pillars to, I think, us being successful in community. One was really embedding into the community. Um, you know, like we look to, open conversations with whoever will uh, is interested in speaking with us. And this includes everyone from the health authority through to the churches, the Lions Club, the Legion, um, just because we never know where there might be an interesting partnership. Um, so we really try and integrate ourselves into the community and exhibit ourselves as a you know, good citizen and a contributor to the community in Salt Spring uh, and engender trust across our partnerships. The second is um, really finding an impactful narrative. And, you know, I wanted to add to your piece, Evan, about men in communities. We've also found that families um, uh, receive a lot of benefit from the men's shed. We have very interesting conversations with wives and daughters um, about uh, how their husbands or fathers are when they come home from a shed or how a shed has impacted their family life. So, um, you know, we're really happy to tell the story of of you know men being together with men and having a safe place um, uh, a safe place to go um, communication we do a lot of communicating um, and I think when I opened the hood on what we've done well um, you know like the consistency of writing grants um, making phone calls hosting visitors at the shed uh, going to board meetings and town hall meetings and community meetings making presentations I think to be successful is to communicate well. Uh, and strong leadership, I mentioned our founder, Tristan Lorillard, who um, he just decided that he was gonna start a shed and nothing was gonna stand in his way. Um, so we inherited that momentum from him. And uh, I, you know, I think we try and do the same thing now, spread it across the board a little bit more, um, but just strong committed uh, leadership uh, and with good connections. Um, you know, We've taken our time to find influential people in the community that can help us understand who's who, um, you know, where, you know, where are their uh, sort of pockets of opportunity and help introduce us to longstanding members of the community. We can flip ahead. Uh, so this is our shed. Um, for us, location was important um, and we were very lucky to stumble across this um, location. <laughs> Um, but it's also indicative, I think, of what you were saying, Evan, about finding a community partner or Ron, sorry. Um, Gizra Gulf Island Seniors Residence Association is our is our primary community partner, uh, and they offer us this shed for free. It sits on land that they own. Um, this is what it looked like about two months after we took over. 
when it was still had the remnants of being a glass shop. Uh, we've since continued to clean a lot of that out and clean up the shed, um, clean up the area around it. Our dilemma is this shed is scheduled to be torn down, um, maybe in a year, maybe longer. We have a lot of ambiguity about our future there. Um, so we're trying to negotiate a long-term relationship with Gizra and we're expanding now into some shipping containers that we can attach onto this, uh, that we can also use as temporary storage if we have to during construction. So this has been our biggest sort of, um, yeah, re reality hurdle to figure out how to um, occupy that space cost effectively uh, and what we're gonna do if we have to move it. Uh, so you can move ahead there. Uh, and membership, um, you know, we've been really fortunate. I think the community uh, is a kind of place where a men's shed is a natural fit. There's over 70% of the population here is over 55, I believe, on Salt Spring. So it's a strong retirement community. Um, our impact narrative is strongly tied to, uh, to healthy seniors and, uh, and the isolation that can sometimes come with that. Um, so Salt Spring itself uh, is conducive. But we have now uh, over 185 members, um, 55 of which I'd say are quite active. Um, and we sort of have the opposite problem, I think, of you, Ron. Um, like we have a lot of members, we have a lot of people using the shed, we have a good shed, we have great tools, um, but we're a little bit slow on the social element of things. And our shed is unheated, you know, there's a small space heater, but uh, our our thing now that we're looking at is partnering with the Legion or another place where we can really um, expand more of the social side of things because I think that's really where the men's shed um, has its special sauce. You can carry on there. Um, and I will say like we, I don't know if we're lucky or if this is by design, but I think we're a pretty capacity group. Um, Tristan, our founder, is very strong in IT. Um, I'm a past uh, CFO for startups, uh, and our present current president uh, is also very savvy in a business context. So it didn't really occur to us to do anything different than build high-capacity systems out of the gate. So we have a, a touchless key fob entry system that every guy gets in the shed. We have a Google workspace for nonprofits, which allows us to run you know, emails and our listserv and Google Forms for signups all for free. Um, and uh, Tristan helped develop our website. So we have a pretty sophisticated technology stack, which has done two things. One, it's meant that we're able to communicate and, and manage our members quite easily. Um, and the FOB is really interesting when someone signs up, which is very easy and free to do online. Um, once they have their key FOB, they can come and go when they want. And it sort of is this like a token of trust and empowerment that all of our members have. Um, it's an expensive system. It was about 8,000 bucks to install the whole thing. But uh, we really continue to see dividends on that. Um, and, you know, as well as understanding the pattern of use of the shed, what times of day, who uses it. So it's a really interesting um, benefit that isn't really about security. It's more about freedom. Um, I should mention we are incorporated as a society. We did that in 2022. Um, I, as a CFO, I'm pretty comfortable with finance. So managing, you know, restricted grant funds and doing accounting for all that kind of stuff is relatively straightforward for us, although it's still um, have to be careful in some respects. But uh, I think we're lucky to be structured in a way that we can take advantage of all these, these um, programs. Uh, and then just the last one there, Evan. Yeah, no, we're really pleased um, with the support. Um, we're excited that HelpAge is taking over this granting program from um, United Way. It's been tremendously valuable to us. Uh, and I think this ecosystem of working with the Sheds and the Sheds Association and having this proximity to granting that understands our mission collectively is super, super valuable. So a uh, big shout out to you, you guys, Evan, for the work you're doing. Thanks, um, Matthew. Appreciate the kind words and that's that's great. Thank you so much for your presentation. and. Cliff, I'll pass it off to you now and, and just direct me how you'd like to how you'd like me to pull up things. OK, the uh, first item I would like to talk about is our startup. And uh, we started in 2015. At, uh, at the historical society in the basement of one of the buildings. 
And a year later, uh, then we moved into the building we are now in, uh, rented there for a few months and ended up buying this building. It's uh, about 9,000 square feet. It cost us 325,000. Uh, to finance it, we went to Northern, Northern Initiative Trust Fund. We got 216,000 from them. Uh, we had $50,000 in the bank and uh, our 16 of our members uh, floated a $5,000 loan each uh, for $80,000 to buy the building. To date, uh, since we bought the building, we've upgraded the kitchen, uh, the lighting, the heating system, the windows, and put new siding. So we've spent another $100,000 on the building. Currently, we have assets of just over $500,000. And 441,000 of that is for building and equipment. Uh, so um, what we do, uh, uh, you know, we're often uh, called upon to uh, help seniors and disabled people move. Uh, we, we build wheelchair ramps for uh, people that are shut in, install safety bars, repair walkers, wheelchairs, scooters, move furniture. Um, we also pick up and store and deliver um, uh, hospital beds for the Northern Health. Uh, one of our fellows or a couple of our fellows will give uh, our own our own local guys uh, that need a ride to Prince George where, for medical appointments. So uh, the, on the next list, uh, if you wanna go to that, Evan, You'll, uh, I've got a list here of all the donations that we've had since 2015. You got that handy there? So there's, uh, there's in all the, the uh, donations that we've received, uh, I've got them listed here since the beginning of time. There's uh, just over $400,000 in different donations. 341,000 is from corporate uh, and uh, foundations. The other 60,000 is from local, local people for a lot of the donations that they've given us for things that we've done for them. So we started in 2015, uh, 2020 we bought the building. We have everything paid for and uh, we have one year's expenses in the bank. The other thing that uh, I'd like to mention is that the, the money that came from corporations and foundations are for fixed assets only. They will not give you any money for operations. So on the, the other sheet that I have here is, is a copy of our financial statement. Um, Ron mentioned that, uh, you know, you had to have uh, audit our statements. At this point in time, we just have a local bookkeeper do our, our statements. Uh, I understand that if we be, had corporate or um, uh, CRS status, then we would have to have audited statements and that cost goes up considerably. So in, in here is um, maybe go to page four on there, uh, Evan, keep going, just to the operation side. Some more. All right, so here you can see from our building, we have some of our building is rented out. So uh, in 22, we had $24,000 in rent. There's uh, carpenter repairs, um, what else do we do there? Oh, picnic tables, things like that is uh, $5,500. Docks and sheds, we, uh, we build the uh, floating docks for to tie your boat up. We have lots of lakes and uh, around here. So we do about 12 to 14 of those a year and make about $1,000 a piece off of them. Mechanical uh, sales, which is uh, repairs. We uh, refurbish uh, fridges, stoves, Washer dryers. This year we will probably uh, keep a hundred from going to the uh, recycle. Uh, 
or to the dump. Garage sales, we did 40,000 and 22. Memberships were $20 a piece. We had uh, last, in 83, we have 82 members. Donations locally at $4,760. We also have a cargo trailer that we rent out or use to pick things up or uh, people can, mem our own members can rent. It's an 18 foot cargo trailer. Local grants or grants, we had uh, 15,000 in the, this particular year, we had $15,000 towards the windows. So our net revenue for 22 was 158,000. So if you go to the last page that I've got or the next uh, schedule, Evan. Which one is this one? Is this Cliff? The, the very last one, the uh, November uh, oh. operation this year. Here we are. So this is our operation uh, for, for this year. We're um, 138,000, um, and then our cost of our goods that uh, we've had to repair and everything. So we have total revenue of 110,000 at this particular time. If you go, if you scroll down a bit, you'll notice that there's expenses of 34,535. Our budget is to give back into our community $42,000 this year. So um, once you own your own building, you can apply for uh, to have your taxes exempt. It's another thing that uh, we've got done locally. When we first started out, things like uh, our internet, uh, the telephone, coffee supplies, they were all donated. So uh, you know, it's a, it, it's we started out slow, like it. Looks like there's a lot of money there involved right now, but we started out very small, uh, very humble over in the in the bottom of the museum and and uh, due to a very good team effort on our part. And we probably have, well, out of the 82 members, I'm gonna say that uh, probably 22 of them are very active and the others support us and that's okay too. So uh, these, uh, Evan, you can make these uh, reports uh, available to anybody, or they can also email us, and uh, and we can uh, we can pass them around. I also included uh, Evan has a copy of uh, our current spreadsheet that we use uh, on a monthly basis. That's great, Cliff, and thank you. I'm not sure if you saw the questions coming in, but I think. Everybody was interested in those things, so I appreciate your willingness to, to share that with the group. I'm sure the ideas will, will keep flowing. So, okay. So, the back over to me. I'm glad that the, the, that everybody had a chance to to chat, uh, to, to share everything they're doing, because I think that's really what the interest of, of our audience is, is seeing what the sheds across the country, the work that they're doing, different ways that they've done things and really seeing what the opportunity is for sheds like this because there's the the really the, the growth is is potential is very high. And so I'm going to spend the last few minutes here going quickly through some of the other grants that we 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 offer at HelpAge and then also some stuff that's in the community. So the startup grant is one thing. We also have what are called project grants and project grants by nature are for projects, which is really a single focused initiative that has a clear start and end. So back to Cliff's point, this isn't necessarily for operation or this is not for operational costs. However, a lot of monthly operational costs for the duration of the project could be covered by this grant, right? So that might be an event. That might be a workshop or training. It might be a video production. The example I use quite frequently is if a community wanted some raised gardens built and for, for the community, they could ask the shed to build that. The shed could apply for funding through HelpAge to get the wood and a table saw, for example, and any other supplies that would be needed. You know, in terms of the, the goal of this is, again, once the shed is, is more established. And so we're looking at a minimum of seven active shed members and demonstrating a track record of regular meetings. So at least meeting for a few months to ensure that the group is, is ready to, to continue. And there's a really important piece here, and I'm gonna go into on the next slide, is that for these project grants, 
the shed does need to be affiliated with what's called a qualified donee. Uh, so I'm just going to put a pin in that for a second. There's another link that we can share in the chat here for the project grants. You'll notice it is a British Columbia website. This is from the historic work that United, the United Way of BC did, uh, but it's used by all applica um, applicants regardless of location. We just we haven't transitioned it to any help age programs, just given um, kind of what's been built already. Um, so that's the, the the if you are applying for a project grant, it'll go through that system, but it's still administered by help age. OK, so what's a qualified donee? So as a charity ourselves, we need to be uh, providing money to other other qualified donees, which, for example, is another registered charity. If you're not sure, so again, some groups are, are registered as nonprofits, but not charities, as was spoken about a little bit already today. And so the qualified donee partner for these projects does need to be a registered charity. And the way to the best way to find that is there's a website here. Again, we can drop these links in the chat at the end of the, at the end of the webinar um, where you can go in and just search up if you're not sure if the organization is a registered charity and you'll be able to find that there. Other other sheds will also partner with their municipality because again, registered Canadian municipalities and, and the vast majority of municipalities are registered in Canada. Um, that's another quali qualified donee partnership that can that can occur, um, and there are others. Um, but most of the most of the other types of qualified donees really aren't applicable in this case. So we wanted to really highlight the the registered charity and the registered municipalities. So what can you use project grant funds for? So of course project expenses, so supplies and equipment, facility rental again for the duration of the project. If there's insurance needed related to the project, again that can be included there. Designing, um, designing and printing and copying of brochures, advertisements, websites, social media, et cetera. What's not eligible in a project grant is major capital costs. So like a vehicle, property, buildings, or permanent change to a structure that's not owned by the shed. So unfortunately, renovations are not an eligible expense for these project grants. Um, and that's where finding some other sources of operational costs uh, where there's less strings attached to them is important. Any costs related to volunteers, so you know, recognition and events, volunteer training or capacity building, um, criminal record checks, honorariums, that would all be eligible in a project grant. Um, contractor fees, if there's travel related, and of course that qualified donee generally will uh, take a small uh, administration fee to help with the project and to, to administer the funds. And so that's okay to be built in as well if we have some um, Registered charities on the call here. There is that that is a permissible permissible uh, expense for these project grants. And again, what responsibilities would you have if you if you receive it? So in terms of holding the funds, the funds are held and administered by the qualified donee partner. But what's important is that qualified donee has an agreement with us as help age to put that money towards the men's shed project. So I've been asked before. Oh, you know, you're giving money to some other charity. Can they use that money for whatever they want? No, they can't. It has to be put towards the project. So it is dedicated resources um, that you applied for. Of course, executing the proposed activities and then the outcome reporting for this is a bit more. Um, there's, a, there's a bit more to it than the startup grants, as I mentioned, both financial, uh, financial and more of a narrative report. Again, what were the challenges, etc. Um, but but the project grants again, because of the the additional money, there are some additional. Uh, outcome reporting its need, but the burden is not too much. And I know we're, I want to make sure we have an opportunity for Q&A, so I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker and please let us know if you're interested because this is a, a piece that's important outside of Help Age Canada. There are other ways to find, as Cliff, Ron and Matthew have all noted, other ways to find funding outside of us. And those are important to pursue. And so the well, I'm going to go through it quickly here. My colleague at the United Way of BC, Bart McMullen, has offered to host kind of a more uh, full scale webinar on this. So if you're interested in these opportunities, please let us know because we're happy to plan another one of these in the future. So again, as our, our other three presenters have talked to talked all, all about grants, donations, sponsorships, fee for service, as Cliff mentioned, they, are, they, they have a trailer that they rent out, they have space that they rent out in kind contributions. These are all different ways um, that a shed can can find funding outside of you know the grants that I mentioned here. Just as an example, sponsorship. You know, I was talking with with Nicole uh, Perry, the director at HelpAge yesterday, and, and with Home Hardware, a local home hard, hardware was was interested in sponsoring a shed. You know, you could have the whatever Vanderhoof Men's Shed 
sponsored by Home Harder, right? And that sponsorship fees, that's one way to bring in funding that might be outside of grants. And those dollars might have less strings attached to them as opposed to the grants, the grants that are offered. So again, an important thing to think about. I think one thing that's really important with whatever external funding you're looking for, and again, our presenters have alluded to this already, is kind of finding that fit. There's not necessarily going to be a grant out there that says, you know, this is for a group of men to get together and do something. It's going to be about looking at, you know, what's the kind of underlying interest there? You know, are there projects or programs related to older adults, maybe mental health, social, social isolation, community building? These are all things that men should do, but it, the grants are necessarily going to be specific to men's shed. So it's important to find that alignment and then looking at eligibility. A lot of these, some of these funding sources uh, will require incorporation. And so it is an important thing to consider. And there are a lot of benefits to informalizing and incorporating as a nonprofit for your shed. I know some sheds choose not to, and that's of course fine, but it does in a way limit you in some of these other um, funding sources without that incorporation piece. And again, um, I will I'll share all these slides with everyone, so I'm just going to quickly go through this, but here are a number of different ways, uh, never different funding sources, government, of course, federal, provincial and local foundations, service clubs like the Rotary Clubs, Lions Clubs, etc. Looking at retiree organizations, other businesses, etc. And so a lot of this can be found by just Googling. And kind of one thing leads to another, and, and you'll notice that you're able to find a lot of other opportunities through just general online searches. But there are some databases as well that are that are free, like the Victoria Foundation database, that can uh, can hand help you find specific funding opportunities as well. And this is a slide that that Barb likes to include in the slide. But there's always money, only the pocket changes. So it's really important to kind of figure out okay, where can we find funding because it is out there you know cliffs the vanderhoof shed is, is a great example of that as is salt spring and what ron has done in burlington they're looking for creative ways to to find and raise funds and so that's really the the important piece here um that i wanted to highlight so we're a little over time i was hoping for a bit more time uh for questions um but I, please feel free if you have i know i've seen it going uh throughout the call here, but please throw your uh, Q&A uh, through your questions in the chat or the Q&A. And I think Nicole is gonna walk us through um, if there's any questions for the group that she's she's seen throughout the presentation. So thanks everyone for your time and for, and for listening. Thanks, Evan. Thanks to all our wonderful presenters too for, for all that you shared. I think it's okay that we've run over time because what's most important is that everyone hears about these resources and how they've been put together uh, in a couple of different contexts as our presenters have shared. So thank you. Um, we do have one question in the Q&A about um, kind of ongoing participation and encouraging that. So for example, if a shed had you know 50 members at the onset, but maybe 10 to 15 members are actually, you know, attending more regularly. Any ideas on how to foster participation from those other 30, 35 who, uh, who originally expressed interest and maybe aren't showing up each week? I don't know whether any of our presenters actually might like to take how uh, take that question, how they fostered participation locally. Great, Ron. Uh, hang on, Ron, I'm just going to, oh, sorry, we've got you on mute if you don't mind taking yourself off mute. Not yet, Ron, I think it's, it, you're actually muted on the, on the Teams app as well. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> okay. Sorry good. about that. No, I, yeah, I, I would go, thanks. I, I would go back to the uh, to the newsletter. It, it's really been important for us. And even though you think people aren't reading it, they are. So you need your their email addresses. You need to put it out there. And we've encouraged people to come out of the woodwork on some of the projects we've done. Unusual things. We we judged a pitch competition at uh, McMaster University for. Uh, students, MBA students who 
had to come up with an idea on what they would do with a five thousand dollar charitable donation. I mean, who knew? Who knew? And uh, and suddenly a couple of guys who weren't normally attending pop up. So I, I think the newsletter is really important. Um, anyway, I don't know whether Matthew or Cliff have answered. You guys have really humbled me. I, 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 our little fledgling shed is feeling smaller and smaller all the time. Well, Cliff has a few years on us, so you know we're good, we're just going to stay hot on his coattails. Good for you guys. One of the things that we do to try and get more participation is uh, we uh, we have a Christmas luncheon, uh, Thanksgiving, barbecues. Uh, we have a, a great coffee pot here. There's, there's at least uh, two two pots on all the time. Uh, lots of people, uh, you know, uh, drop off baking uh, because we've done some work for them or help grandma or mother or somebody in the past and uh, so all of us always got to watch our weight <laughs> nice problem but uh, once once you get going in the community it gets behind you it's it's unbelievable what can happen and uh, reputation is a great thing ourselves and Fraser Lake now is right on our co coattails uh, they they uh, made applications and they're going to own their own building here very quickly so, uh, uh, you know, our, our storefront, yeah, it, it, it does a great job for us, but it's secondary as far as is the mental health for the, our members and uh, the shoulder to shoulder. I will say too, that we expect it to be, uh, that there's gonna be a small number of people who are highly engaged and, and so on down. Like we have 185 members on the books, but, um, probably about 50 are actively using the shed and there's probably about 12 or 15 who are really active in leading volunteer activities and there's three of us on the board so we don't pretend or expect um, the same level of participation from everybody it's just natural that it's it's spread it's spread kind of unevenly that's just the way folks the way that folks are so we're we're always happy to take contributions and engagement from from guys who are who are interested and everyone else is free to use the shed. And I just want to come back to one thing that Ron, you just said at the end of your answer there, the, the intention today was to really show, you know, how a shed can work through in sheds at different stages. And so I know you mentioned you felt humbled by, by the other two presenters, but that was the, the point was to show, okay, here's, here's a really emerging shed a year in, right? And then you look at shed like Vanderhoof, it's been around almost a decade, right? and then Salt Springs somewhere in the middle there, right? So that the, was the really the, the hope was to show everyone how a shed can kind of move through different phases. Um, so anyways, just wanted to add that, add that comment on top, Ron. Yeah, like anything successful, we didn't start out of nothing 18 months ago. I think the original idea was in early 2021. So, I mean, you know, things take time. Um, um, yeah, build a canoe, take your time. <laughs> We've got another great question um, coming from uh, Bill Murphy, wondering if um, any if any of our presenters or Evan, you're aware of other means that sheds are addressing the operational costs. Um, and I think we're looking for examples here, kind of like Cliff was able to share. So I'll, I'll just kind of look at the floor of presenters and, and maybe raise your hand if, if you want to add any other thoughts you have about addressing operational costs. Well, we haven't um, talked about this today, and I haven't heard examples of it from either of the other two guys, but we're starting, or I'm starting to look at it, potentially setting up an endowment fund with one of our community foundations on the island. Um, you know, actually our operating costs every year are not that high. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't take a huge permanent gift held by a foundation that we earn the interest off every year to fund our operational expenses. So, you know, we're super grateful for the grants, but there are a lot of work to administer, uh, this, the number of them that we have, um, and, you know, continuing to raise money just to survive every year is a burden on the leadership. Um, so uh, we would love to follow the example of the hospital foundation or other successful community organizations that fund their core operating costs off a long-term endowment fund. 
I'd, I'd like to add uh, a little bit more. In, in our case, the stuff that gets donated to us and that we recycle, uh, how we work it out is, or one of the rules, rules of thumb that we use is, is that if, if the amount of labor and the parts we use, our labor, we figure at $25 an hour. And if the parts and the labor together, if we can't get a third of what the product is new online, then we don't fix it. We'll send it for a recycle. And that's where all our stuff comes from. The people dropping it off, like the, the wife got a new washer and dryer. The dryer's still okay, but the washer needs a new pump. We'll fix it. And we'll sell it for a third of what the new price is. So there, furniture, beds, uh, frames. Uh, you know, our, our front end is uh, normally you can't move in there. Right now it's empty. So we're uh, hoping in the new year, we're gonna get a whole bunch of new stuff in. But it, it once it starts, it, it's, it just starts, it just comes and comes. So that's, that's another avenue. Right. And um, it is uh, it is 3.30. I know there's going to be folks who have to start dropping off. So I am just going to say that we've received a number of questions um, asking about how you can have access to the information shared today. Um, you did register when you joined the webinar. So we have your email address. We'll send out slides. I've put uh, the Help Age Canada contact information in the chat. Um, but if our presenters are willing, we'll follow up with their contact information as well for any um, me uh, mentorship or questions that they might be able to answer specifically. Um, so just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and any last minute questions, pop them in the chat because uh, I'll note them down. But Evan, let me turn it over to you to, to close out. Thanks, Nicole, and, and yeah, thanks everyone for registering. This is the first time we've we've posted a webinar like this. This is my first time posting it on on Microsoft Teams as well. Um, it seems to have gone pretty well, but I know there are some technical issues, so we will work work on that too. And you know, please reach out. I know most people will have my email because I think I probably emailed most people here to, to to come join. But if you don't, Nicole's dropped that the Help Age Men's Chat email in the chat, so please reach out there. Um, and I'd be happy to, to meet one on one with people to discuss grants and whatnot um, and, and see how we can get more sheds started and sustained across the country. Um, and I really just want to thank Cliff, Matthew and Ron for, for joining us today um, and sharing a bit about your, your work. It's, it was great to hear. And I always say that every time I hear a shedder speak, I, I feel like I learn more and it re-motivates me to continue the work that we do. So thank all thank you all three of you for joining us today.